glad you're here today because I want to tell you about a little secret. <clears throat> some of you may see it as a secret, but some of you may see it as, as a little bit of, of gossip. Um, this is good gossip. This is gossip I'll let you share with other people, and I won't even turn you in. See, Jesus may have actually been the most scandalous man to ever walk the face of the earth. His methods were perplexing and questionable at times. The company that he hung around with was speculative. His friends were rash and constantly doubting him. His murder was seeded by betrayal and hate. And his resurrection was even covered up. He became enemies with the people who were in power. But he became friends with the people who were drenched in sin. He was a self-proclaimed son of God. He was scandalous. There was a scandal that took place. And, and when we look at Jesus' life, we... We can't help but be confused by the words that he spoke at times. You see, this Jesus guy, he was a little backwards. He didn't make much sense in our culture today and definitely not back then. He didn't make all that much sense. You see, he said things like this, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. When was the last time you thought of a poor person as being blessed? It's kind of contrary to what we think, right? He says, blessed are those who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, because you will laugh one day. But then he really gets confusing because he goes on and he says blessed are you when people hate you when they exclude you and when they insult you I don't know about you but I don't know that I've ever felt blessed in those moments I'm not blessed all that much but he says, woe to those who are rich, for you already have received your comfort. You've received it now, so you won't get it later. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. But then he said some of the most strangest things that, that I've never heard before people say before he, he said love your enemies and bless those who persecute you he said to one person that if you go to court and, and a man asks for your coat don't resist him but give him your shirt also I haven't seen that too much at the courthouse lately. He says, if someone asks you to go one mile, say okay, but then go with them another mile. If, if someone hits you, turn the other cheek to him and offer that one as well. Is he trying to trick us? What was he thinking? What was going through his mind? You see, there was something different about this man, Jesus, who claimed to be the Messiah. You see, there had been people prior to him who had claimed to be the exact same person. They had claimed to be the Messiah. But you know, they died. And... No one's ever seen him again. 
We can go to their graves and we can see right where they're buried. And that was the end. You see, there was something even more strange about this guy. You see, there was something spiritual about him because he pointed to God, but yet he hated religion. He hated religion. I'm pretty sure when he heard the word religion, it was one of those things that just kind of made the hair on the back of his neck stand up. He just couldn't take it. But you see, there was these, these guys that just really rubbed him the wrong way. They were, they were referred to as the teachers of the law or the Pharisees. Jesus really couldn't make up his mind how he felt about these guys sometimes. You see, because we read kind of varying truths about what he says, and it can be confusing. He says in Matthew 5, 20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay. But then Luke 20, 46 says, Beware the teachers of the law. They... they they like to walk around in flowing robes and, and they love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and, and have in the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor. He says, beware of them. Okay. But then a little bit later in, in Matthew 23, verse 2 and 3, he says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. Okay, now I'm confused. But do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. Okay, I, now I'm really confused because one minute Jesus is saying, beware of them because of who they are. But then he turns around and says, you better do what they do or do what they say. Because they were put in the position of authority that Moses was in. But why was it when we look through the scriptures, the only time we see Jesus really get angry is when he's dealing with these religious Pharisees. Why is it? Jesus went on to make it very clear that he did not care at all for the religion of the Pharisees. He went on to call them a brood of vipers, blind guides, hypocrites. Then he really insulted them one day when he said that they were spiritually blind people. But they were supposed to be the spiritual elite of the time and he says that they're blind you see it wasn't that Jesus hated the Pharisees you see I'm quite confident that he actually loved them and that's why it hurt so much because he loved them so much that's why it hurt to watch them live lives and to watch them put so much focus and attention on things that would not last you see the pharisees and their religion had distracted them from the true purpose of why jesus had come you see, religion was never meant to point to ourselves. Religion was never meant to be about us. It was always meant to be about God. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they had taken the laws that they had created and they had made it to be about them. See, see if, if you hear some of the things about their religion. Maybe it might sound a little familiar to you um, in today's context. The first thing about their religion was it was based in legalism. It was a religion of legalism. Listen to this from Matthew 15. 
It says, Then some Pharisees and the teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when, when he prophesied about you. He said, these people will honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You see, God had given them laws that they were supposed to fulfill, but the Pharisees went beyond that and created 613 more laws to make sure that you didn't break the laws that God gave them. And it became the human rules. It became the most important rules, became the 613 that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law had created. That was more important. And those traditions trumped what God had initially said. And what Jesus is telling them here is, you have put your laws above God's. And it's your standards that you hold the people to, not God's. Jesus was one day, he healed a person on the Sabbath, or he healed the person on what we have today, Sunday. You weren't allowed to do anything on Sunday. You couldn't even walk two feet outside your home, or you were breaking the Sabbath law. However, it did say in the law that, that if your donkey fell into a hole that it was okay for you to do work to get the donkey out of the hole. However, Jesus could not heal someone who was sick. Huh. Maybe a little legalistic. One other time, Jesus was walking through the fields. He was teaching his disciples. And the Pharisees watched as the disciples began to pick the heads of grain off the wheat and they began to eat it. And this was the Sabbath. They were working because they were picking the grain. How dare they pick grain on the Sabbath? Let me make this a little more at home for you. What about those people that go into those church buildings that don't wear the right clothes? Because you have to wear your Sunday best on Sundays. And if you don't wear your Sunday best or you don't look a certain way, I'm going to spend the rest of the service talking about you. I don't quite care what the songs we sing or, or what the pastor talks about. What I'm more concerned about is why aren't you wearing a suit and tie today? Now, we don't have that problem here, thank God. But you better believe there are places that do. What about those, those music people up on that? platform thing you know why don't they sing the songs i like let me write down my list of a pre-approved songs so that they can get it right next week no it's true or we don't play the right instrument Who's that pastor think he is banging on those loud things? You know, it, it, I love being a pastor and being able to do that because I know it agitates some people. <laughs> As if I don't do that enough. But, but religion becomes legalistic 
when we begin to enforce our traditions or our beliefs above what's most important, and that's God. The second thing that we see in the Pharisees is this religion of inferiority and guilt. You see, one day Jesus, he was sitting around the dinner table and he was in the home of a tax collector and he was eating with sinners. Those sinners, how dare he, a a man that is a rabbi, go into the house of sinners and have a meal with them. Eating a meal was one of the most sacred things that you could do. And here, here he is sharing a meal with sinners. Jesus heard the Pharisees. Well, no, he actually didn't hear them. He knew what they were thinking. And he said, you know what? I didn't come for the righteous. I didn't come for the healthy people. I'm here for the sick people. I'm here for the people who need me the most. And those are the people who are far from me. Those are the sinners the saved the sinners Matthew 23 verses 4 and 13 Jesus addressing the Pharisees here he says they tie up heavy cumbersome loads and and put them on other people's shoulders but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who enter who are trying. The religion of the Pharisees became the door that stood in front of the kingdom of God and said, you can't enter because you're not good enough. But excuse me, because I need to go in. Because they were. Because they were the holiest of the holy people. No one knew more about God's law than they did. So who was anyone else to tell them any different? You're below us. We're above you. Because we're holy. In Luke 18, it says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. He said, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, opposite polar enemies of each other. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He he would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who are humble will be, be themselves will be exalted. You see, the Pharisee cared more about the sins of everyone else, yet he failed to acknowledge his own sin. And the tax collector, who is the most sinful of the time, they viewed them as the most sinful people of the time, and he says, you know what? I'm nothing short of a sinner. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. The next one is a religion of self. 
a religion of self. You see, the Pharisees exalted themselves above everyone else. It was always about, hey, look at me. Look how holy I am. Matthew 23, 5 through 7. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. Phylacteries were, was a little box that God said, to write my words upon your forehead. So they literally put the scriptures, they wrote it really tiny, and they put it on a little piece of paper, and they put it on a box, and they wore it on their foreheads. Kind of ridiculous, if you ask me. But hey, whatever makes you think you're holy, go ahead and do it. Their phylacteries, whoop, whoop, sorry, I'm spitting all over the place. Got a little Italian in me today, everything. Their tassels, um, they, their tassels were like under their coats. But that wasn't holy enough. That wouldn't bring enough attention to the Pharisees. So what they did was they extended their prayer shawl so that their tassels would hang down below their coats so that people would see, hey, look at me. I've got my prayer shawl on. I wear it everywhere I go, just not when I'm in prayer. But look at me, I'm holy. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. Luke 20, 45 through 47. While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at the banquets. They devour widows' houses for a show, make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. You'll be happy to know after reading this, I've decided to make all my prayers very short um, so that I will not be punished for long prayers. You know, that's not the case, what they're talking about. You see, what they were doing was they would go on and they would go into these deep theological things that no one had a clue what in the world they were saying. And they were doing it as though, hey, look at me. Look at how much I know. Have you ever heard, uh, and I could be guilty of this sometimes too, have have you ever heard a pastor, and you've been, and you've listened to a message, and you're like, I have no clue what half of those words mean that he just said. Like justification or sanctification. They're in the Bible, and people look at it, what in the world is he talking about? Or consubstantiation. I mean, what in the world is that? Well, it's referring to communion. I mean, honestly, have you ever been in a church like that? It's it's ridiculous. It's hard. It's like, what in the world is this guy saying? You're supposed to be helping me understand God's word, not making it more confusing. But when it's about us, We want everyone to look at us because of how holy we are. And you see, here's the last thing. The last thing about the religion of the Pharisees was it was a religion of works. You see, they didn't emphasize so much the faith that they had to have in God. It was an emphasis on what they did. Because if they fulfilled the law, And not just God's law, but if they did all the extra 613 laws and they were good about keeping those, then they could go to heaven and be with God. Only if they followed the law. See, but Jesus tells us that it's about faith. That it's about believing and putting our trust and our hope in Jesus Christ that that is what gets us into that relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's in that relationship, it's out of that relationship of that love and that mercy that God has for us and that we pour into that relationship to build with him. It's out of that that come the works. It's out of your faith. It's out of your love for God and what he's done for you that you say, you know what? I don't want to serve people because I have to. I want to serve these people because you know what? God loves them. Therefore, I'm going to love them too. Jesus. 
Jesus does not care about your religion. Jesus does not care whether you're Methodist or Baptist, Pentecostal or Catholic. What he cares about is where your heart is with him. Do you love him? Do you seek to have a relationship with him? Do you read your Bible simply to gain knowledge? Or are you reading your Bible to grow in your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you come to church simply to fulfill an obligation to check a box at the end of your week? Or do you come to church to grow in your faith and, and to encourage other people in their faith? You see, we can do the right things for the wrong reasons. And it's called religion. Why do we do the things that we do? I always like to find creative ways to, to tell you things and to communicate things. And I came across this young man who, who, who kind of puts the Pharisees and they're in the teachers of the law, and he boils it down into their religion, and he tells us what Jesus wants from us and what he expects from us, but he does it in a very creative way, and I will admit this may be out of some of your comfort zone, but don't listen to the beat in the background. Listen to the words coming out of his mouth. What if I told you Jesus came to abolish religion? What if I told you voting Republican really wasn't his mission? What if I told you Republican doesn't automatically mean Christian and just because you call some people blind doesn't automatically give you vision? I mean, if religion is so great, why has it started so many wars? Why does it build huge churches but fails to feed the poor? Tell single moms God doesn't love them if they've ever had a divorce, but in the Old Testament, God actually calls religious people whores. Religion might preach grace, but another thing they practice, tend to ridicule God's people, they did it to John the Baptist. They can't fix their problems and so they just mask it, not realizing religion's like spraying perfume on a casket. See, the problem with religion is it never gets to the core. It's just behavior modification, like a long list of chores. Like, let's dress up the outside, make it look nice and neat, but it's funny, that's what they used to do to mummies while the corpse rots underneath. Now I ain't judging, I'm just saying, quit putting on a fake look. Because there's a problem if people only know that you're a Christian by your Facebook. I mean, in every other aspect of life, you know that logic's unworthy. It's like saying you play for the Lakers just because you bought a jersey. See, this was me too, but no one seemed to be on to me. Acting like a church kid while addicted to pornography. See, on Sunday I'd go to church, but Saturday getting faded, acting if I was simply created to just have sex and get wasted. See, I spent my whole life building this facade of neatness, but now that I know Jesus, I boast in my weakness. Because if grace is water, then the church should be an ocean. It's not a museum for good people, it's a hospital for the broken. Which means I don't have to hide my failure, I don't have to hide my sin. Because it doesn't depend on me, it depends on Him. See, because when I was God's enemy, and certainly not a fan, He looked down and said, I want that man. Which is why Jesus hated religion, and for it he called them fools. Don't you see so much better than just following some rules? Now let me clarify. I love the church, I love the Bible, and yes, I believe in sin. But if Jesus came to your church, would they actually let him in? See, remember he was called a glutton and a drunkard by religious men. But the Son of God never supports self-righteousness, not now, not then. Now back to the point, one thing is vital to mention how Jesus and religion are on opposite spectrums. See, one's the work of God, but one's a man-made invention. See, one is the cure, but the other's the infection. See, because religion says do, Jesus says done. Religion says slave, Jesus says son. Religion puts you in bondage, while Jesus sets you free. Religion makes you blind, but Jesus makes you see. And that's why religion and Jesus are two different clans. Religion is man searching for God. Christianity is God searching for man, which is why salvation is freely mine and forgiveness is my own. Not based on my merits, but Jesus' obedience alone. 
because he took the crown of thorns and the blood dripped down his face. He took what we all deserve. I guess that's why you call it grace. And while being murdered, he yelled, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Because when he was dangling on that cross, he was thinking of you. And he absorbed all your sin and he buried it in the tomb, which is why I'm kneeling at the cross saying, come on, there's room. So for religion, no, I hate it. In fact, I literally resent it. Because when Jesus said, it is finished, I believe he meant it. Ponder on that for a little bit. Hopefully for a long time, actually, because there's a lot in there. But you see, there's a big difference between simply fulfilling obligations and doing things that are religious and believing and having faith in Jesus Christ. See, what I don't want is a church full of people who think we've made it, that we've arrived. Because we will never arrive. I don't care if we become a church that packs this room three times on every Sunday. We have not arrived. Because our work as a church has only really begun. Until we have loved every person who feels like they're not worthy to be loved. And I don't know that that will ever happen. But as long as we think and live a life that is being led by religion, we will never see the potential that Jesus has for our individual lives and for this church. It's only in seeing God and living for God that we will begin to see life transformation take place. You see, because as a pastor, one day I had a huge wake-up call that shook me that shook my, even my faith, even my leadership as a pastor. And believe it or not, I was here, up here, and had been preaching here for three years. When a young man came and sat over here, and some of you may know him, his name is Carl. And Carl attended here for a while. He would come in early, and he would get some cookies and a drink. But there were some Sundays where I would come in and when I walked in the door, you know who I saw sleeping in our yard? Carl. You know, he would tell me about the stories of some of the things that were going on in the home that he lived in, but I really didn't understand or didn't even really take him all that seriously. But then a family who doesn't go to church took him in. And they began to actually give him his welfare benefits. They actually began to make sure that his prescriptions were being filled. And, and all of a sudden now he, he's taking his medication and he's becoming this totally different person. You can actually understand him when he talks. And, and they shaved him and I mean he just looks like a totally different guy and then it hit me. I cared about one thing. I cared about what Carl believed. I cared about his spiritual health. And you know, I don't think Carl's given his life to Christ. But you know, if he had, what would we have done as a church? You see, I think what we would have done is we would have said, praise God for Carl that he's given his life to you and then we would let him walk out our door and continue to live on the street.
Read through the four Gospels sometime. And you'll notice a trend that when Jesus heals somebody, when Jesus forgives their sins, he heals them. And it doesn't just change their life spiritually, it changes their life economically, socially. Everything changes because of who Jesus is. And you see, when we care about religion, we only care about the spiritual health of a person. But you see, I believe that God wants us to care more about the whole person than simply their spiritual health. You see, I believe something deep in my heart that if one of us would have taken Carl in, And one of us who sat in the very room with him and called ourselves Christians and followers of Christ, if one of us would have taken him in, how high, how much more likely would it be that Carl would be putting his faith in an almighty God because he realized that the church loved him and his brokenness and not just simply where he was going when he died. It's time for us to forget our religion. It's time for us to pick up a cross and live the life a scandalous Savior has called us to live. 